Jacqueline, Martin, welcome to a society session, the Change Society podcast. I've probably in the last sort of three months have spent a lot of time with both of you and we've been threatening to jump on a um, session and, and, and have a conversation that we can maybe share with um, some of the Change Society and our, our wider audience. So look, the theme of today, um, 84% of transformations fail. It's a stat that's going in the wrong direction. I remember when I set this business up, it was 70%. It's looking at 84, 85% now, depending on um, what publications you're looking at, um, you know, what kind of um, stats that you're, you're, you're looking at. Um, and it, even reading the other, the other day, I think it was um, in the US alone, was it 1.3 trillion was poured into um, digital change. And obviously 70% of that, um, you know, ha has been wasted. So it's, it's a big problem. Um, but before we get into that, because that is the theme of today, uh, I thought it'd be good for you both just to do you know, a, a quick introduction, who you are, what you do, um, just for the listeners. So um, Jacqueline, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. So I'm an operating partner here at SNS. Uh, I've been involved in change and transformation for all of my career, uh, worked in many different industries, so telco, um, consultancy, financial services, uh, with organisations such as BCG and MasterCard and EE. Um, and I've always uh, worked on the delivery side and, and I work now mainly client side as well, uh, focusing on the delivery and, and sometimes the governance of it as well. My specialisms now are strategy to, strategy to execution, uh, being change ready and people and culture. Fantastic. Uh, Martin McPhee? Well, that's a hard one to follow. Um, <laughs> You're too kind. Yes. <laughs> Um, much like Jacks, I have uh, I have been involved in uh, change and transformation for uh, too many years that I care to remember. Uh, for the last four years, I've been working with uh, many of the large scale private equities, uh, helping them look at companies and how digital transformation can actually enable them to become more mobile, agile, and global. Prior to that, I worked with two uh, wonderful global companies uh, called Cisco and uh, where I spent three years there working for John Chambers, um, helping him think about all things IoT, digital and what that meant for changes in society, countries and enterprises. And then prior to that, I had a decade at Accenture where I helped Accenture build their technology outsourcing and consulting business um, very proudly from a couple hundred million to three and a half billion when I left with 15,000 people working around the world. Fantastic. So what I like about this, we've got two different perspectives on the problem. So Martin, um, you know, copious amounts of experience with management consulting, uh, more recent times, private equity working with um, you know board CEOs and and, and other executive members. And then of course, Jack's um, you know client side change agent for sort of the last 15, 20 years. So, um, question to you both, and uh, feel free for one of you to step up first. But why is this stat going in the wrong way? Why are eighty four percent of change initiatives and transformations failing? In your views. Jax, would you like no. me to have a go at that? Go on, you go first. There you go. Um, I think the key thing, Pat, and there's been a lot of, uh, you know, this is an industry that uses lots of buzzwords. And, and the word that's been going around for the last really six, seven years is digital transformation. And, you know, initially it was, so what is digital? What does that mean? Well, today it's actually more than a buzzword for modern businesses. You know, I believe that the lines are being blurred between business and technology change, just driven by so many disruptive influences, trends and market transitions. And, you know, today that's all happening at a time when economic pressure is stressing the balance sheet. As an industry, change was actually built 25 years ago when many companies were building ERP projects that took multiple, multiple years. And what's happened over the last 10 and why the, ch this, the stat is going the wrong way, I like to accredit someone famous called Albert Einstein, which is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. People are trying to crack the problem of digital transformation 
with the same processes, the same approach, the same linear build and change world that was successful for ERP. And it's just not successful um, for today's company in the speed that they need to actually move and how fast exponential change is happening. Yeah, and I think to, just to build on what Martin's saying there, you know, the world that we live in now is volatile, disruptive, and there's a pace of change that we've just never seen before as human beings operating in a commercial environment. And we are much more comfortable when we understand how our actions drive certain outcomes. So when we're working in um, a simple or a complicated environment, that all makes sense to us. But change these days isn't. It's complex because there are so many different factors at play. And we can't predetermine an outcome based on our own actions. So a natural human response to that is to try and put more control around it. So we might build lengthy and detailed project plans. We might put for some very strict governance around the change that we're trying to do. But actually, that's not when we're thriving and successful in a change environment. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons that why, why we're seeing that, that statistic kind of go higher and higher in effect. So if we look at, Martin, in the context that you were saying, um, you, you know, 25 years ago, um, you know, the way people did change, you know, looking at sort of the Big Bang approach to ERP programs and all those kind of good things. So if we set that in the context of, um, you, you know, organizations set up back then and the way that organizations need to be set up today, what do you see as the main sort of traps and barriers? Uh, and this question's to both of you. Um, you, you know, in the way for effective change to, to come through uh, this decade to help organisations thrive? What, what, what do you see in the sort of old organisational debt structure, if you like, that, that, that is in the way for, for some of the progress that we'd all like to see? Well, as I said the other part, this is not anything new. You know, I, I, I sat seven years ago at Cisco doing all of the kind of primary research around how GDP would change in terms of digital transformation for countries like India, the UK, and on. And much has been written, kind of dissecting the reason for digital transformation fail. And it's kind of interesting, I hear a lot from experts settling on, it's kind of people, employees, it's organizational culture, and it's leadership as the weak links. Well, kind of I step back, the first thing I kind of look at is, I don't think that people are the problem. You're seeing world-class organizations who lead the way in, in their own area of expertise, um, failing to kind of achieve what they want to achieve from the transformation of their own company. So most initiatives, whether it's digitizing core processes, installing new technology, downsizing, restructuring, etc., or even trying to change the corporate culture, have that low success rate. I think in the end of the day when I come down to it is it's, it's cracking the new code. And, and, and one of the new areas of discipline that I think the companies need to think about is strategy. You know, leading effective change is not just something that starts with, well, you know, a number of consultants together, the board, the management team got together to find a strategy and then decided to roll it out to the greater organization. It kind of is something that starts at the top the moment that you start to talk about strategy because change must start at the very top. I, I just think that all too often senior teams believe that they're actually on board with a new strategy and that it's actually the rest of the organization that creates that resistance and that's what they need to address. But I don't think that's true, Pat. I think in the end of the day, People underestimate getting buy-in and building consensus at the highest level of organization is not nearly as easy as it seems. Back to what Jax was saying, the speed that you need to move, if you don't have people aligned right at the very start of the strategy, right at the very start of the journey, the wheels can come off very quickly. Yeah. And just, you, you made me think of something there, Martin, in terms of how we work today versus how we worked 100 years ago. And we really haven't changed very much in terms of our organizational design and how we're structured within an organization. Some companies now are looking much more at the operating model, which, which looks much broader in terms of the processes and the technology and how we're working together. 
but a lot of the time we still focus on our, our organizational design which drives silo thinking it drives us to focus on tasks rather than outcomes and it drives transactional behavior as well and actually what we need to be doing is shifting that to working collaboratively irrespective of what team you're in focusing on the outcome and the delivery of that outcome um, you know to, to to kind of a brilliant level of quality um, and that also means that we link we need to be linking the strategy as martin says right through it needs to be that really clear link right through from strategy to the work that the teams or the outcome that the teams are working on it's it, just to add to that part and, and, and it is around structures around communication it's around strategy but the reality is a lot of um, a lot of us who's kind of grown up in this area um, we were educated to think in a linear manner and not an exponential manner. Yeah. We are, we move into enterprise organizations and we are measured by X percent increase in sales or Y increase benefit in operational performance. We're, we are not rewarded for thinking exponentially from looking at how you can disrupt something that was designed and is operating 20, 30 years and, and looking at how you can actually do something more effective for your customer or drive operational efficiencies. So as I say, when you start to look at that strategy, it's, it's first of all, communicate with inspir inspiration uh, behind the change so that everyone gets on the same page by getting that kind of buy-in and looking at all aspects, whether it's strategy, whether it's organizational structure, whether it's communications, whether it's actually the team and the skills that you, that you have in your team. You know, these are all the areas that you want to test up front um, to really understand have you got that likelihood of success and the wonderful thing about an ERP project of 25 years ago, it would take three years. You had lots of slow time to work out where was the gaps, let's fill that gap, let's upskill, let's do that. But a change project at this moment in time can be, you know, let's look at the events of recently um, where a global workforce moved from working in an office to working at home. If you start to actually look at the, the, the big video providers, Cisco with their WebEx, Microsoft with their Teams, and so on, it, the stats out there are quite startling. They reckon that digital transformation mm -hmm. of working practices accelerated six years in six weeks. So it's the weeks to drive change rather than what historically allowed for a lot of time. What would you say is the kind of one thing that, would re that really needs to change to kind of change the scripts? So if we put it on the um, sort of frame of, I think, Martin, you mentioned cracking the new code of, of you know, delivering change and, and um, you know, delivering change in this new era. What do you think is the kind of the one thing that has to change to, to, to start, um, you know, cracking that new code? Um. The challenge part is if it was one thing, it would be easy and then anyone could do it. So if we say and cracking the new code, so if we framed it in a different way, 84% of transformations fail. I mean, this is quite a binary thing, but just in the interest of this conversation, 16% succeed or at least deliver some sort of improvement to the organization. So if we think there's, there's things that people do in the 16 that they don't do in the 84, what would you say are some of the sort of hallmarks of... Um, things that should be done um, to 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 change the scripts on that on on that stat and reverse it. Okay. Um, so if I if I go through all of my career path and many things that I wanted to drive in a business, um, there was many world class organisations who could come in and provide an assessment of. If I take Accenture, what did high performance look like? What did a high performance finance organization look like? What did a high performance IT organization look like? It enabled you to kind of benchmark against um, what best in class looked like, understand your maturity, and be able to prioritize and take steps um, to think about in each of those elements your strategy. 
the reality is from, from and, I, and I will talk client side, um, many of the clients that I've engaged with, and you always had this, 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 <laughs> this discussion is we had a good strategy um, and we believed in that strategy, but we didn't manage the change very well. And, and you look at the consulting partner and the consulting partner had actually built what it was the client actually wanted. But as I kind of looked at it, there was a nice brand new car lying in the driveway, but actually no one knew how to drive it because at the end of the day, they hadn't looked at all aspects of change. So what is the thing that you can do differently? And to me, I think realistically, some of the things of digitization that's actually important this moment in time around data science and analytics and artificial intelligence is actually starting to become a reality um, in this industry and to help organizations really understand how complex this journey is, what is the aspects that they need to understand with the problem um, and help boards, management teams align and create that light bulb moment to help them understand and align on what they collectively need to do to actually drive successful change. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the biggest thing is I, I look at many other stats and one of the biggest stats that come out there is why does change fail? Yeah. Well, teams work in silos. Yeah. And it's the mm -hmm. silos that if you're trying to move fast and everyone's disconnected by 5%, well, actually, by the time you try to get the outcome of the change they're trying to drive across a full organization, then again, that's just kind of a recipe for either one or two things. Either the project fails to achieve what it does, what it's set out to do. It either gets de-scoped to allow it to come within a certain budget. Or if you use a little start from the Standish Group, Standish Group says 53% of these projects end up costing 189% of the budget. So many boards, many executive teams wouldn't even enter into the change project to start with because it's not yielding the kind of operational benefits or new customer experience that it would do. So, yeah. you know, unfortunately, Pat, I'm not giving you one thing there because it is complex. But the good thing about it is I do think with data science and analytics, um, that we're starting to see insights that can help us really drive a, a greater likelihood of change success. And I think, you know, to add to that, and Walter and I have talked about this at length over the last few months as well, and I think it comes back to me, it comes back to this, this complexity um, and, and the, the question of how do, we, how do we best succeed in a complex world? That's, that's the critical question for me. And there's complexity everywhere in our lives, right? It's not just within business, it's within our personal lives as well. And, and whether it's for me personally, and I, I liken it to um, being a working mother. So that's quite complex. You're trying to develop and enjoy a career as well as be the mother that you want at home. And, and it's exactly the same thing. And for me, the way to address it is to get really strong foundations in place. So the change in hand, absolutely. Be visionary, focus on all of that. But it's really looking, it's being brave and breathing and looking inwardly inside your organisation and saying, well, where do we need to strengthen ourselves to set ourselves up for the best possible chance of success through this quite disruptive and challenging change journey that we're going to go through and continue going through for the foreseeable future? You know, this isn't going to change as well. And when you get those foundations in place, it's not just about... Help in enabling you to be brilliant in the change that you're managing in that period of time. It's really setting yourself up for future, future success as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to change it slightly. Um, so if we talk about um, sustainability, why is it that most organizations historically and still now are treating change as a commodity, do you think? Um, it's a very, very good question, Pat. And, and, and the answer to the answer to why is organizations treating change as a commodity, I honestly don't know. Because if you're sitting there as a leader, and as a leader, you're an incredibly smart individual who's had a phenomenally successful career, and you're sitting there saying to yourself, 
I'm about to actually embark on this change initiative. Um, and 84% of change initiatives fail. And for those that actually do kind of serve their time, 53% of them cost 189%. Why is it I think I'm one of the 16%? And those smart people, how do they know what success looks like if you don't measure it? Mm. And, you know, I, I, do, I do come back, I kind of, back to what I kind of said there. I think organizations best position to drive successful change are the ones that set themselves up well right from the start. Yep. They use digitization to their benefit. They, correct the, they collect the right kind of data. They use predictive analytic models to get themselves on the right path. And then they prioritize the right activity required to drive successful outcomes. It, and that is the key to it. And back to, I think, something that Jack's mentioned earlier, it's like you sit down with them and go, well, I hired the best program manager um, that had been and they had a great track record. And then I hired another 20 people that have got great success or change. And I go, have the 20 people ever worked together before? No. Well, how do you expect them to be a highly synchronized team that can drive change? The second aspect is, well, we had a project plan. That project plan had 5,269 lines. And I go, what was on line 4,600? They go, I don't know. And this is the problem is as individuals with the amount of data that we get, you know, social media, email, et cetera, how do you drive effective change if you're not understanding what is the right data you need to know, what is the right path and how you prioritize that activity and then use that data to continually measure, are you on track? You know, and there's a number of simple things that you can actually do. But I go back, people are using approaches, processes, capabilities, and tools that worked in an era that was yesterday. And it's about cracking that code of understanding the blueprint that helps them be successful today. Mm. So, also- bring, so bringing in some sort of kind of gamification and data science and analytics into managing uh, uh, and driving the change process to, cr- to create something sustainable. Is that, is that what you're saying, Martin? Yeah, yeah. Well, two things. But you'll never do anything without people. Um, but the first aspect is, and this I go back to what I said earlier, data science and analytics is becoming a reality. Um, the maturity of understanding um, really how individual bias and and kind of company bias and culture can influence what change is, is is something that helps with sustainability. But this goes beyond being able to deploy a new tool or a process. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you've, you've heard me say this many times, a fool with a tool is still a fool. It needs, you know, it needs data. It needs analytics it needs um predictive analysis to define the right path but then you need the right skill sets to actually execute on that prioritized journey um so therefore one plus one equals a three if you have a tool tool is going to give you the insight you just don't know what to do with the tool if you bring people in that are unstructured they don't play as a team one plus one equals you know, gives you a greater likelihood of success. I also think in terms of your question earlier about transaction, I think one of the, the, the reasons it's dr- we're seeing this behavior within organizations is because of the pressure that they're under. So organizationally and the boards themselves are under such pressure, whether it be from parent companies or, you know, a, a, a desperation to keep up with competition in the market or whatever that, ever that is, they've become quite reactive in terms of their, their their strategy and and how forward thinking they are and they're just reacting to market pressures and ball pressures and so on Um, and that drives a much 
shorter term view in terms of how to approach change and, and the actions that are taken. So, so Pat, just on this, I was talking to a client the other day there, very, very senior person, chief executive in a financial services organization. And I was talking around this principle of um, data science and predictive analytics, and actually a tool that enables you to actually have a scoring metrics across all of the areas of change. And interestingly, that CEO quickly got onto the situation where I, I, I did say to him, I said, look, if you score above 80%, then actually it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to have a successful outcome. But you know what? You've got a good chance of it. If you get between 50 and 80%, then you know what? You really should be testing the budget because this is all about expectation management. You might be able to pull off the transformation, but it's going to cost more that's in this business case because I get that. And then he turned and said, and if it's below 50%, I should stop the project, shouldn't I? And I went, yes, because your chance of success is so low. Would you rather have that news today and be able to do something about it? Or do you want to wait until you're five months into the project, you've spent 10 million pounds, mm -hmm. and you're kind of saying to yourself, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Well, actually, you know what? I'd like to know the hindsight up front. And the predictive yeah. analytics might not be perfect, but at the end of the day, it's given me great insight mm -hmm. into how my organization is going to behave. It must be terrifying being a CEO or a COO and looking at that 16% success. And how can you be confident as an organization that you're going to be in that 16%? That's yeah. really what people want to do to de-risk their change. That's hard. It is hard. And by the way, today, if you look at what's happening in the, in the global world and, and, and what's happening with this, this horrible pandemic, being a CEO is even harder. You know, you've, you've got an, an employee um, workforce that's changing the way they're working. You have got significant challenges on liquidity um, because the business has changed and you're sitting there at this moment in time knowing that if you don't change, you will not be competitive mm. in what a post-pandemic world looks like. But when you're sitting there and you're saying technology, transformation, et cetera, is something I need to do, but you're looking at a stat that says 84% is failing and it's getting higher, Wow, that takes a brave individual mm -hmm. to actually say, I'm going to go to the board and you know, hang my hat on this multi-million pound project that's going to be the saviour of theirs. So it is difficult. And as I said to the CEO, you know, first of all, you know, having that type of assessment, having that analytics gives you not only insight into how you as an individual react from a change bias and, and your things, but actually across your leadership team, um, your management and your, and your company. And that is an insight as a CEO that allows you to have a better prediction on what the future can mm -hmm. look like. Do you think this kind of short termism versus long term views that that needs to change? If you look at the footsies, at the moment, um, let's just call it FTSE 500 and the average tenure of a CEO. Do you think that's part of the problem with the, with, with, uh, the, the stats as they are, that some of them are too fearful to, to even embark on this in the first place? They'd rather push it down the road and sweat as much profit as possible and stay out the firing line or outsource it. Do you, do you think that's part of the problem? Or? <laughs> You've got a right smile there, so maybe you're thinking... No, no, you just made me smile because it took me back to a lunch I had in New York about... God, 10 years ago, when a very famous global CIO of one of the big investment banks um, talked to me on that specific topic of, he said to me, I forgot everything that he taught me because in the end of the day, it was about short termism because the average tenure of a CIO back then was three years and you can't go into long-term disruptive change. The reality today, Pat, and look, some industries um, don't have to think um, too heavily about disruption, um, but not many. 
if you're in the telecommunications industry, you're in the technology industry, you're in the financial services, et cetera, you have got disruptive companies um, basically attacking your profit base all of the time. So, you know, it, it, it's a horrible thing to say that every company must have, must be driving change and must have change at the heart of his agenda. Um, but that is the reality today, Pat. And one of the things I was very, very proud that I set up at Cisco was a joint venture with uh, IMD, the global business school based out in Switzerland, to set up the Center for Digital Transformation. And, and they did some phenomenal primary research around the speed of change. And the reality is what they, they analyzed is if you look at the Fortune 100, digital transformation can actually change the full structure of the, formula, uh, the Fortune 100 within three years. It used to be 10, 12 for technology and business models to change. So the speed of change means that if you're not thinking about your competition, not thinking about how you engage with your clients differently, not think about transformational projects, then the reality is your own business model is going to be attacked. So it is an imperative now. It's that pu published research as well. Um, I'll just yes. share it in the, in the show notes afterwards. Yes, I can, uh, I, can, I can give you the published research from IMD and Cisco primary research on uh, what is called the digital vortex. So I think, so I think uh, you know, the point you raise about um, the, the tenure or length of time that a, a board member uh, stays in an organisation inevitably influences how the organisation approaches change. But as Martin says, the world around them is changing at such a pace and so quickly, that starts to pale to be less significant, not to insignificant, but to be less significant. And actually, I think if you get a very strong culture set up around delivering value regularly, which is what we need to be doing in today's age, not having three-year programs, but delivering value regularly, then the fact that a board member is only around for two years, however long it is, becomes less critical because it becomes right. less influential in terms of how effectively they can deliver change. Yeah, I, I, those brave pathfinders to, to yeah. make that leap sooner rather than yeah. later because it will, but, it will get easier. It should get easier. Well, it will get easier. Look, I had the pleasure of, of, of working with one of the, the greatest leaders that this, the, the technology industry has seen in the last 25 years, namely John Chambers. And as John used to say is when he first started in Cisco, his, his first strategy as CEO look to the next decade. When he retired the CEO, he actually said his strategy was the best three years, but he really focused on 18 months because John had this wonderful knack of seeing the transitions, but the transitions were happening so fast that he was revisiting effectively, not the core strategy, but learn, evolve, learn, evolve, mm -hmm. really every 90 days. Yeah. And, and, and that is the speed I, I think we are moving it today. The rate of change and the evolution in business and technology is only going to continue and, and actually even pick up more speed. Yeah. Um, so I do think that implementing the right approach and, and structure and, and using the right data and the right insights is the foundation of positioning your organization to be more agile, proactive, and ready to come out on top, whatever yep. challenge or opportunity mm. kind of comes to us in the future. Yeah, I mean, when you say the definition of insanity, a lot of the things that I've been seeing at the front line for, for years are, you know, most organizations are trying to unpick the past, mm. you know, sort, solve the legacy, um, and, and just trying to do something in an organization structure that, that just isn't, isn't fit for purpose. So it, that totally resonates with me about, it's more about, you know, reverse engineering the future. And I think if we look at the pandemic and COVID, I think what we've also seen, and a lot of the execs I'm talking to, they've tasted extreme change now. No one saw the pandemic coming. Once it came, you know, the board was aligned. 
Um, you, you know, they knew what they needed to do in a matter of days, you know, weeks. Um, uh, uh, they got all of the organization pulling in one direction. They, they cleared the, the politics and, you know, some of the governance and, and created a free road for them to then accelerate an outcome of, you know, a global remote working policy or, you know, driving an extreme uh, piece of change around, you know, the digitization of the workplace. So, you know, that appetite, you know, should be there for, 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 for further gains. On that think, note, go on, sorry. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about the stats. They're stacked up against you, right? Really scary stats. And we've talked about, um, that's, quite a, that's quite a difficult position to be in when you're driving change. And we've talked about how the world's moving at such a pace. And, and, and actually, one might listen to this podcast and think, God, that's a bit terrifying. But actually, there is the opportunity. And that's what Martin and I were talking about in terms of when you get it right, it's awesome right? And it's the most exciting place to be when you're delivering fantastic change in an organisation because you're really shaping the future of work, you're shaping the future of your country or globally or whatever that might be. And it's brilliant and you get an engaged workforce who are learning and sharing their knowledge, you're delivering value and great results and you can see, individuals can see how they're contributing to the vision and the evolution of the company and, and it's a brilliant, brilliant place to be. So I just want to make sure that we're kind of pulling out all of those positives of delivering complex change within an organisation as well, because none of us would be involved in that if it wasn't a brilliant and exciting place to be. Yeah, it's a good shout. I mean, I was out for dinner with a CEO last night that you know, Jax, and, um, yeah. you know, one of his comments was, you know, it's great now. All of the old problems that we have are gone. On. And I actually think they're now gone forever. You know, our company is change ready. It wants change. It likes change. And um, they actually feel that they're working on, you know, much more interesting work because, um, you know, they're geared up for, um, you know, continuous change now. So, um, you know, that's just great to see when you hear the success stories coming through. Yeah. I mean, on that note, Jax, sustainability, we talked about that previously. You know, in your view, you know, it's not just about, um, having organizations that are change ready and, 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 and are able to pivot and, you know, potentially continue reinvent themselves throughout this decade. But in your view, what, what are the secrets behind getting that sustainability and that change readiness and, yeah. and, and your views and tips to any listeners that might be thinking, okay, I get, I, I get that, um, you know, this started off with, you know, quite a negative stat, but actually, you know, there's a real opportunity to improve that. And what's, yeah. what, what's cracking the code there in your view? Yeah, so for me, it, when we, talk, we talked a little bit about being change ready, and it is really what it, what it says on the tin that, but um, that goes hand in hand with sustainability, because when an organisation is change ready, and I'll talk about that a little bit, you can deliver change that is, is sustainable. And when we in SNS talk about being change ready, we are really talking about those foundations of change that we talked about earlier on in the podcast. And um, so the foundations of change that where you, if you're strong, then you are really de-risking your change and, and starting to alter that 16%. Uh, you're looking at strategy, leadership, people, um, customer delivery and value. And if you strengthen your foundations across all of those areas, that's when you're setting yourself up for success. And that's when you're making sure your organization is one of those 16%. And in, in, in part two, Jax's point earlier, you know, there's lots of examples of, of organizations who actually are getting that right. Yeah. And, and once they've strengthened those six disciplines, they're then using that same approach and leveraging it against not only their own organization, their customers, their partners, their suppliers, and, and, and their investors, just to name but a few. You know, it's in a way of actually being able to drive um, effective, sustainable, and enabling change across all aspects of your, of your own uh, business supply chain. And... I think the, the again I come back to it the, the most effective organizations don't just measure this when they start a change journey. Mm. They, they, they use yeah. analytics, insight, etc. to continue to actually test this as a heartbeat of the organization. And and mm. you know, because at the end of the day, you know what? Every 1st of January, we all come out with this wonderful idea that we're all going to the gym. You know what? We're looking at all the stats. We're getting fitter. We're getting healthier, et cetera, et cetera. When summer comes along, we normally disappear, drink too much, eat too much, lie in the sun, et cetera, et cetera. And if we don't go back to the gym, you know what? We suddenly become unhealthy again with that. 
So one of these, you know, I think the most successful companies are the ones that, as I say, get themselves in the right position to start with, understand what it needs to be fit, to be ready, to be successful to enter into this journey. And then they use the same process over and over again just to, to ensure that they are not getting into bad habits and, and they continually can be change ready, much like the CEO that you spoke to, spoke about that you had dinner with last night. I mean, you know, there's, there's many career moments that, that I've had from, you know, the services that I've always provided and that we provide at Sun and Stanley, but, you know, what, one of them, I mean, there were two separate businesses. Um, you know, what, what one of them was, you know, Pat, can't thank you so much from a CIO who said, the business phoned me up to say, can, can you stop delivering the change so quickly? Um, we're not ready for the next release. But I think the one that really took it was the dinner with the CEO last night who, who said, I no longer fear change anymore as a CEO. And, and you know, I sort of walked out of that restaurant with a big sort of spring in my step. That, you know, that's the energy that we want to bring to, to the business world. You know, you don't, you don't have to fear change. Um, you know, you can, you can simplify it um, with, with the right um, partners and, and, and the right mindset. And yeah, that, that's, that's the way to make a dent in that, in that change problem. So Martin, Jacqueline, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed that conversation. Um, I always like to finish off with a practical ending. So for any change leaders out there, CEOs, anyone that's got private equity breathing down their neck, uh, has got shareholders breathing down their neck. Uh, Martin, we'll go with you first. What advice have you got for leaders out there that are leading uh, businesses and leading change in this decade, today, tomorrow, next quarter, next year and beyond? Don't fear change. Um, find a partner who can actually help you with the right tools, collect the right data, use the predictive analytics, and help you prioritize the right activity so that you know what? You've got a good chance of success. Fantastic. Jacqueline? Really simple from me. Just make sure you've got really strong foundations of change. Fantastic. Uh, I'll share all of the um, uh, links to some of the things that we signposted in um, in this podcast in the show notes. So that'll be all there. Um, thank you both. Look thank forward you. to speaking to you again soon. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Thanks Take very care. Much. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the Change Society podcast. Sullivan and Stanley is an award-winning specialist change consultancy that deploys expert teams to solve the challenges companies face when undertaking change. To find out more, please head over to our website, sullivanstanley.com.